All right, I see our numbers are still steadily rising, but perhaps we have most of the people in the room um, and we can get started. So I want to start by welcoming everybody to this webinar. Um, new gas plants are coming to Ontario and we're gonna talk about how we can stop them and build a clean energy future. Um, this webinar is organized by the team at Environmental Defence. I am so grateful for them putting this together. Environmental Defence is a leading Canadian environmental advocacy organization that works with government, industry, and individuals to defend clean water, a safe climate, and healthy communities. I'm very excited to be invited to be moderating tonight's discussion. My name is Kimi Razajian. I'm the community organizer currently based in what is now called Windsor, Ontario. I am also a member of the Windsor Essex Youth Climate Council, and I organized some advocacy in Windsor to stop the plant uh, the planned gas plant expansion a couple months ago. Um, and so as somebody who's been on the other side trying to stop gas plant expansion, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panelists, learning about what we can do in Windsor and also across Ontario um, to protect our air, protect our water and protect our lands. Windsor is located on um, what is currently the on the territory of the Three Fires Confederacy, which comprises the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, um, who stewarded the lands and waters for generations so that now I can live here safely. Um, and now, and many of our panelists are joining from Tecoronto area, which has been the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, Huron-Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee, and is now home to many um, individuals of different First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities and peoples. Colonization has brought with it the destruction um, of lands and waters, not honoring the treaties and the relationships that were built um, or not built with Indigenous peoples on the lands on which now we occupy has led us to this place um, of of potentially intoxicating our airs and intoxicating our waters. So it's important to think about and reflect upon um, many of us as potentially settlers and occupiers on these territories, what our responsibilities are to protecting the lands on which we live and how we honor and respect the indigenous laws, the treaties, um, including the Upper Canada Treaties, the Dish with One Spoon Agreement, as well as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, in now living on these lands. And so I invite everybody to take a moment of reflection and think about your relationship to the lands on which you live and what responsibilities that creates um, in this fight, in this conversation about um, stopping gas plant expansion and in land protection and relationship building in general. So thank you for taking the time to reflect on that and to join us tonight. Um, uh, if you would like to turn on closed captioning for this event, um, you can go into the meeting controls toolbar at the bottom of your screen and click show closed captions, which is a CC icon at the bottom. So tonight we're going to be starting with an overview from Lana about uh, why we should oppose the construction and expansion of polluting gas plants and what the alternatives are where the new gas plant projects could be built and how we can stop them. Then we'll hear from Yafet, who's going to share with us his own experience of successfully organizing to stop a gas plant in his community and provide some key guidance and pointers for the rest of us who may be looking to, to do the same thing in our communities. And finally, we're going to hear from Jack, who's going to talk to us all about the incredible efforts that got Ontario to phase out coal and why we can phase out polluting gas plants as well. So with this information, we'll share ways to get involved as well as to learn more. And at the end, we're going to open the floor for questions and answers with our panelists um, or any clarifications on what is discussed. So if you do have questions you'd like to ask, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, um, there's a button that is a Q&A button. If you click that, you can type in your questions and we'll do our best to respond to all of the questions we can get to at the end. Um, and we're also going to ask the panelists some of the questions that you have uh, submitted in advance. So without further ado, I would love to introduce Lana Goldberg, who is the Ontario Climate Program Manager at Environmental Defence, where she advocates to improve climate policies in the province. She's also a longtime environmental justice organizer and has been campaigning on climate issues for over 10 years. I have admired Lana's work for a very long time, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from her. So Lana, you can take us away. Thanks so much, Kimia. Uh, thanks for opening for us. And hi, everyone. Okay, well, let's start with the basics. So uh, the electricity we use in our homes and businesses comes from several sources, mostly nuclear power, hydropower, and gas plants. 
To produce electricity, gas plants burn natural gas, or more accurately, fossil gas, because it is a fossil fuel and there is nothing clean or green about it. The fossil gas we use in Ontario largely comes from fracking operations in the US and Western Canada, which means in addition to the CO2 released from burning the gas here, we are also contributing to emissions that occur before the gas even gets here. To explain these fugitive emissions, as they're called, we have to talk about methane. Fossil gas is predominantly made of methane, which is a greenhouse gas more potent than carbon dioxide, especially in the short term. To give you a sense, methane is over 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide in the first 20 year period, so its shorter term climate impacts are huge. Already, methane is responsible for about 0.3 degrees of warming. Stopping this methane from getting into the atmosphere can shave off 0.5 degrees of warming from our current trajectory and keep the door to the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees open for a little longer. So it's critical that we rein in methane emissions, and fossil gas is a big contributor to these emissions. When fossil gas is extracted, produced, and transported, huge amounts of methane leak into the atmosphere. These are what we call fugitive emissions. So to bring down methane emissions, we need to stop relying on fossil gas. In addition to the climate impacts, there are also other impacts like health repercussions from the use of fossil gas. Fracking operations release toxic chemicals and poison local water supplies, which can cause asthma, nausea, birth defects, and even cancer in people who neighbor gas sites. Living close to fracking operations, rural and indigenous communities are often disproportionately impacted by fracking in Canada, like in the Northeast region of British Columbia. There can also be health impacts where the gas is used. Gas plants emit nitrogen oxides, which increase smog and reduce air quality where the gas plant is located and can cause respiratory problems for people living nearby, especially if there are other high emitting facilities in the area. So with all of these negative consequences, it's clear that we shouldn't be expanding our use of fossil gas and should in fact be quickly decreasing our dependence on it. So what are the alternatives to generate electricity in Ontario? In the short term, we could import hydroelectric power from Quebec, which is clean and very cheap and uh, available. In the medium term, we can build renewable energy projects like wind and solar, which are now the cheapest form of new electricity generation. These can be combined with currently available storage technologies, which allow the energy to be stored and used when needed. Just in the last year, we've seen several studies that show Ontario can fully meet, meet its electricity needs through clean energy. We can also improve energy efficiency programs and fund retrofits that would substantially bring down the demand for electricity. There are other benefits to switching to clean energy as well, like cheaper electricity bills for customers. While fossil gas prices have been rising and will continue to be volatile, the prices for wind and solar have been decreasing and will continue to do so. Building a clean electricity grid would also keep profits in Ontario, create more jobs, and attract investments from businesses that are increasingly committing to using 100% clean energy. But the government, the current government of Ontario is adamant about using and expanding the use of fossil gas. The government's plan to ramp up the use of gas is projected to increase electricity emissions by almost 800% by 2040. As if it weren't problematic enough that we currently have about 50 gas plants in operation and that they are being fired up more and more, this government now wants new gas plants built. This runs counter to the federal government's coming clean electricity regulations, which are supposed to bring electricity grids across the country to net zero by 2035. Due to these new federal regulations, it's possible that Ontario's gas plants will have to shut down, which is good for the climate. But guess what? Ontario has promised new gas operators that they will continue to get paid even if they have to shut down due to the new regulations. And guess who will be paying them? Us, ratepayers. We may have 
to keep paying gas plant companies even if they stop producing electricity. It's a total boondoggle. Another energy scam is hydrogen ready gas plants. Some of the proposals we're seeing claim to be hydrogen ready, but the projects aren't promising to use 100% hydrogen for a long time. So the proposals are really just to blend hydrogen into the gas mix, which would only reduce emissions a little bit. The major problem is that 99% of the currently available hydrogen is made using fossil gas and burning fossil derived hydrogen results in about the same emissions as a regular gas plant. While it's possible that hydrogen made from renewable sources will become more available, it doesn't make sense to use clean energy to produce hydrogen just to use it in gas plants to generate electricity. We're much better off using renewables to produce the electricity directly. In the end, these hydrogen ready proposals are convoluted industry developed plans to keep gas plants in operation. Such plant proposals are already on the table in Windsor and St. Clair Township near Sarnia. Where else could we see gas plant proposals? Well, the easiest way to build more gas generation is to expand existing facilities rather than build new ones. So we expect most of the new generation to come from the construction of new gas turbines at existing gas plants. Uh, there are many gas plants in central and southern Ontario, but the independent electricity system operator, which manages Ontario's electricity grid, has identified priority areas which overlap with most of the gas plants along the southern end of Ontario. As I mentioned, we've already seen new gas projects proposed, and we expect to see additional proposals emerge in the coming days, weeks, and months. The good news is that we can stop these projects. That's because the government and the independent electricity system operator are requiring gas plant companies to get municipal resolutions in support of their new projects. Since council members want to remain popular and get reelected, they often listen to their constituents. If they hear from masses of their constituents that they don't want a gas project in their community, it's very possible they will say no. And if the council as a whole votes down a proposal, the project will not be able to proceed. Just to clarify, because uh, some folks have asked, the projects that need municipal support are those that would feed into the province's electricity grid. So some gas projects like the McMaster University one in Hamilton, which only serve a specific facility, do not have to go through the independent electricity system operators process and do not require municipal resolutions and support. But it's really the government backed mass expansion of gas generation across the province that is the larger battle we're facing right now. I'll talk a bit more about how we can go about ensuring that municipal councils decline gas projects and instead advocate for renewable energy. But first, let's hear about some success stories around stopping gas plants and phasing out coal. Thank you so much, Lana, for that overview and lay of the land. Um, I'm excited too to hear about some success stories. Um, first, we're going to hear from Yafet, who will share his experience of successfully organizing and stopping a proposed gas plant in the York Southwestern area. So Yafet Toelde is the sector manager for long-term care at SEIU Healthcare Local One Canada. He has over 20 years of experience in political and community organizing and is a PhD candidate specializing in black studies, critical race theory, multiculturalism and policing. He was also a candidate in the 2019 federal election. Yafet, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for having me and um, glad to be here. Uh, so let's jump into it. Um, so the gas plant that uh, we, I was part of helped in stopping, it was a part of a large coalition of uh, community residents um, and organizations that um, uh, really took, took on the fight to do local organizing. And I think the key, that's going to be a key part of what I'm going to share with you today is the importance of local organizing and, and how to do it. So York Southwestern is a is, is a, a community in the uh, West End of Toronto. Um, and the gas plant that uh, we were faced with, um, this is back in uh, November of 2015 is when we when groups of us became 
uh, first became aware. Uh, it was in November 2015 at a public meeting by Crosslinks Transit Solutions that the local community in York Southwestern uh, was presented with um, a plan detailing the, uh, the company's plan for uh, the Eglinton maintenance and storage facility on the Kodak lands. So if you know West End Toronto, we're talking the areas around Keel, Eglinton, Weston Road. Um, if you've heard of the Eglinton LRT, this is um, the, the, the most recent train project that is supposed to come online, uh, you know, in Toronto constructions forever. So it's supposed to be coming online sometime soon. Um, and in 2015, these were, we were in the early days of the plan being, of, uh, being proposed. And as part of the Eglinton LRT, uh, the west end of Toronto, uh, West End and Eglinton Road was going to be on the west end of where the train was going to end. And here was where a maintenance and storage facility was going to be built on what was called the former Kodak lands. Um, this was an area that was, you know, um, going to be redeveloped. Uh, and so in November 2015, this was a meeting that was part of a series of community consultations that really had started almost two years prior. Um, but was worrying at this meeting was that this was the first time where a new structure was referred to as a, quote, backup power facility for the Eglinton LRT and an adjacent site reserved for a future go slash up express power facility. And this is the first time these plans for a power facility had been shared with the public. Um, and yet it was a very, it was really just a series of poster boards that were shown that to anybody who came to this, to this public meeting. And so, uh, when asked more clarification, the details that were provided was that the Eglinton Crosstown LRT backup power facility would be a natural gas power plant. The plant would include six 3.3 megawatt gas fired generators, five for use during regular operation of the power plant, and one to act as a backup or fail safe. And this backup concept became a key component throughout the time that this plan is being proposed. Uh, that there's nothing to worry about. It's just the backup. It'll, it'll like almost like it'll never be used. Um, and we were told that the purpose was to provide emergency backup power for the Eglinton uh, transit system. And in the event of a blackout or unplanned power disturbance, it would be, quote, fired up to get the LRT vehicles back to the storage facility. But no details provided on the amount of electricity that would be needed to run the LRT vehicle station to get it back. No clarity was given as to how uh the or how often the facility would need to be quote fired up for regular maintenance and testing and we're also told that the backup power facility would be turned on to provide peak power relief if requested by toronto hydro so this wasn't uh, while this was local uh, at a very local level it wasn't strictly at the municipal level in fact it was actually primarily a provincial issue because the Eglinton LRT was was under like i said like i said the crosslinks transit solutions cts and which was a consortium under Metrolinks, uh, which is a, a body uh, tied to the provincial government. So the organ organizing that was needed really required uh, engagement at the provincial level and at the municipal levels. And so this is what the, this bombshell really was what kickstarted the local organizing, which is which really consisted of a coalition of um, local residents, environment groups, and community uh, organizers uh, and community organizations, uh, environments, community environments organizations. Um, and so York Southwestern had a long history of, of stopping other types of uh, projects. In fact, right around this time in 2015, uh, the, the group was, uh, local residents were successful in stopping diesel train trips running through the community every day. And so when this was dropped, uh, not long after, you can imagine the surprise of now saying a gas fire power plant was going to be used and some unknown power source for the Up Express um, was coming. And so, and Metrolinks and, and Crosslink Transit Solution, thus the province, made it very difficult to ascertain why such a facility was needed. It was unclear why cleaner electric power options had not been considered. Um, and the concerns were, of course, the the uh, the carbon dioxide that would be added uh, to uh, to the pollution and um, the harmful nit nitrogen oxides that would be would be emitted. So, because of the scale of the project that was being proposed, with the train being built, the LRT being built, and uh, the 
historic facility that was going to revitalize these abandoned lands on the west end of Toronto, like I said, around the Weston and Eglinton area. It was really seen uh, as an opportunity to really uh, uh, pilot cleaner sources of energy. And so that, that became the key ask because cleaner sources of backup power was seen that were needed and were already part of Ontario's climate change strategy. And this gas, this gas powered plant that was being proposed seemed to not consider um, the alter alternative power. So that became the ask. We wanted to stop the gas power plants and we wanted to see real exploration of alternative sources of energy, clean sources of energy. Um, and so that was really key because all throughout the consultation process, there was much uh, 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 insights given around the installation of solar panels on the roof of the maintenance facility and other planned buildings. The scale of this made it so that it was it had a real opportunity um, to be uh, uh, to exhibit the uh, the commitments from the province, from Metrolinx, and Crossing Transit Solutions about taking sustainability mandates seriously. And so this was something that became a, a key um, organizing tool. And so the, the things that were engaged that we did, like I said, this was a coalition of local residents, of, of uh, community organizations. And so um, there was a lot of uh, letter writing directly to uh, several levels of the then liberal provincial government. And so this included the local MPP with, with Laurel Albanese at the time, um, the uh, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, the uh, Minister of Transportation, who was Stephen Del Duca at the time, the Minister of Energy, uh, the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Um, and then, of course, to the local uh, uh, municipal council, because Toronto Hydro, a municipal body, was also, was also involved. So uh, connecting to the local councillors at the time, because the LRT was going to run through both of uh, bo both of their communities as well, too. And so um, uh, really raising the awareness that residents had concern was a big was a big key. But we also held a series of local information sessions um, where the goal was to educate the community on what was happening, because, you know, the, like I said, the LRT was just in the infancy stage. And so the, but the construction was going to be starting relatively soon. Um, at least if this was in 2015, we were told at least a couple years from then that it was going to be starting. So the consultation process was an important time to get involved to prevent it from before shovels were in the ground. Um, myself, I was a local resident. I, I lived in the community. I was actually living very close to where um, the, the uh, proposed power plant was going to be. But I also worked in the community and I actually worked at a, at a local youth organization where I oversaw programs at this youth, local youth organization. And I use this as an opportunity to use the youth leadership mandate that was existing, that exists in the nonprofit sector as a way to get local high school age young people, particularly from racially marginalized communities active in their community. And in my view, environmental protection was tied to the ways communities prosper. Um, York Southwestern was, had been historically disadvantaged economically, particularly for black and immigrant communities. And this revitalizing of these old lands that have been abandoned for a long time should be tied to uplifting these communities that have been targeted. And a gas plant only created further environmental harm, thus economic harm. So this became a key piece and pushing back against the narrative that existed at the province and municipal levels. This concept that it was only a backup, basically saying it would never be used or that the need for uh, would be very slim. Uh, when attending information sessions that were held by Metrolinx. So although it was technically a private body that was contracted out by the provincial government, it was still seen as a provincial body by us. And so attending those information sessions and information sessions and put and really um, forcing them to provide details. And when we got to that point, it was really clear that um, that they didn't have those kind of details. And us getting in on the ground floor really um, was not something they were ready for. Uh, and, you know, when you would ask, when you push for alternatives and when you would ask what kind of insight was done into alternatives, you can see not much was done. Uh, we would get, we would get like very nasty feedback around, um, you know, that nuclear was the only alternative that was possible. 
Um, and that really the only uh, there was very little consultation that was done. Um, this was something, like I said, that had not existed. Um, and it really came down to the, the level of uh, investment that was needed to explore and implement real alternative clean energy solutions was not something that was considered. So um, there was a lot of pressure on Alcor throughout uh, the end of 2015, going up throughout the end of 2016. Um, and this pressure was, like I said, attending a lot of these local information sessions. And engaging locally really means uh, identifying how, what are ways that you can be present at municipal and, and local provincial meetings, uh, particularly held brought by elected officials, because this is where change happens. Um, and being consistent is important because it is not the size of the, pe the, the, the group that you have that uh, matters, in my opinion, when it comes to local organizing, but it's about your ability to be consistent and present and visible that matters. Um, and we had a broad, we had a broad spectrum of people at the table, resident groups, uh, a variety of resident groups are at the table, leveraging our own personal resources, like myself, leveraging the resources we had at the, at the, um, at the organization I was at, where we could use those, the, the stories and voices of young people to get involved was a key, was a key component and being, and, and being present in our own organ, our own education that counteracted the narrative that was coming from Metrolinks, Crosslink, Transit Solution, and the provincial municipal governments. And so all in all, we were, six, we were successful in getting the power plant stopped, but we weren't successful in the clean alternative solutions. And this came about really in March of 2017. So throughout, throughout our push, we were told, it, it was, we were seen like we were hitting a brick wall until March of 2017, the then Liberal government uh, suddenly announced that the, the, the gas plant was going to be scrapped, that the maintenance and storage facility that was getting built was no longer going to have a gas plant com component of it. So while we weren't successful in the solar panels proposal or things like that we, we suggested, they did take our suggestion in looking at quote-unquote innovative alternatives, and they came up with it, what they called the innovative battery solution. And so the then Liberal government uh, decided to implement, instead of this gas plant and needing a backup source under the new plan, they developed what's called the, the battery energy storage facility, which would be connected to the existing hydro grid and charged during off-peak periods when energy is cheap, such as overnight. And the stored energy could then be used to supply energy to cross town throughout the day. And the batteries could also provide backup power in the event of an outage, which would be critical to removing trains from tunnels and providing ventilation during an emergency. And so um, what really came down to was it didn't require, our plan required them to invest money and they their plan was to, how do we use our existing infrastructure? And so, but it did show what, what we did see was a template for how local organizing was worked how it's forced them to have to consider alternatives and um, really uh, put on the map that they that real community consultation uh, was not was not something that could be ignored. Uh, those are like I think some of the key things I want I wanted to share. It was um, it was it was a, it was a great victory. Well, the then Liberal government definitely took it upon themselves to share that they you know listen to the community quote unquote listen to the community and and uh, and and made sure that they took community consultation uh, in, into, um, in, into account. But the reality is they only did that because of the pressure we, we put on for almost two years that, uh, to, to actually pay attention to the community because their original plan was not to do that. Um, and so uh, paying attention to local initiatives and getting involved locally is super important. Um, and, you know, like I said, identifying allies and creating a broad spectrum of supporters, educating community at the local level was so key. Small and big, consistency is the key, not the size. And let's be real, elect better governments. Um, if I, I have to take this opportunity, the path of 2026 and electing a new provincial government started yesterday, started last year after the last provincial election. Um, and if we struggled under a liberal government, which has shown inconsistency, uh, with um, with a uh, 
uh, environmental protection, the conservatives definitely are going to go backwards even that much more. So get involved, get involved locally now, identify your supporters and get out there and educate the community. Uh, those are my key messages. I, I, I'm sure we, we can have some more questions um, at, at, at the Q&A, but thank you very much uh, uh, for, for listening, letting me share. Back to you, Kimia. <laughs> Sorry, classic Zoom meeting. Um, but I was saying how how incredible it was what you what you shared and the patterns we saw in Windsor as well. And hopefully that's a sign to people that the same arguments are brought up. In Windsor, it was the same thing. There is um, economic development. There were scare tactics around there was going to be blackouts and brownouts if we don't uh, expand natural gas and um, that this was the only option and so the rhetoric that it's a backup and it'll never be used and that's why we can't have a battery it was actually used as a justification that we can't do a battery storage system because the gas plant's a backup it's never going to turn on anyway so i think everyone should take note that the same kind of rhetoric and arguments are used in different places that's fascinating so thank you for sharing um and i'm excited now to hear from jack gibbons about how in the past people organized to phase out coal in ontario and so jack has been the the chair of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance since 1997. Jack, since the year I was born, that's incredible. Uh, he's an economist, a former Toronto Hydro Commissioner, and a former Ontario Energy Board staff member. So lots of knowledge, lots of experience, and we're excited to learn from what you have to share. Jack, take it away. Uh, thank you very much. And it's great to have the opportunity to talk with, uh, with people tonight about our campaign to phase out Ontario's uh, dirty coal-fired power plants. Now today, virtually everyone agrees that phasing out dirty coal-fired power plants makes sense. But when we launched our campaign in 1997, that was definitely not the conventional wisdom. So when we launched our campaign, all the sophisticated people in Ontario were sure that we were going to fail. And, and there were good reasons for their skepticism, because back then in 1997, no jurisdiction anywhere in the world had phased out its dirty coal plants to protect public health or the environment. And also, we were involved in a really David and Goliath battle. In 1997, when the Clean Air Alliance was established, we had only two employees, and they were both part-time, and we had only $20,000 in the bank. And let's recall what we were up against. We were up against uh, Ontario Hydro, which owned the five dirty coal plants. And at the time, Ontario Hydro was one of the biggest electric utilities in the world, and it was one of the largest corporations in Canada. In addition, uh, at the beginning of this century, dirty coal provided us with 25% of our electricity. Third, when we started our campaign, the majority of people in Ontario didn't even know that we had coal-fired power plants. And they certainly didn't know that our Nanako coal-fired power plant on Lake Erie was the largest coal plant in North America and Canada's number one air polluter. And our fourth challenge was that when we started, uh, Mike Harris was the premier of Ontario. And Mike Harris was a conservative like Doug Ford. He was very right wing. And no one thought that he would phase out the dirty coal plants just to please some environmentalists. So, so we had a huge challenge. And so there was good reason why pe the sophisticated people thought our campaign would fail. But nevertheless, we proved them wrong and we proved them wrong very quickly. In, in 2001, just four years after uh, we launched our campaign, Mike Harris's Minister of the Environment issued a legally binding regulation requiring the phase out of coal burning at the Lakeview coal plant in Mississauga. And then in 2002, just five years after we were uh, created, the new Premier of Ontario, Ernie Eves, committed Ontario uh, to a complete phase out of all of its dirty coal plants by 2015. So an amazing success in, in just five years. So how do we do it? Well, it's a, it's a very long and complicated story. 
And so tonight, I'm just going to focus on four key factors that helped us uh, uh, achieve success. And the four factors are, first, the Ontario Medical Association, second, Mayor Hazel McCallion of Mississauga, third, Dalton McGinty, and fourth, the, the fact that we were uh, persistent. So let's start with the, the Ontario Medical Association. Well, air pollution, uh, smog had been a problem in, in Ontario for many, many years when we were established. And, and environmentalists had repeatedly called for uh, governments to take action uh, to clean the air. But politicians could ignore environmentalists. And so everything changed when the Ontario Medical Association got involved. In May 1998, the Ontario Medical Association had a press conference in a downtown Toronto hotel, and it was packed with media and TV cameras. And at that press conference, the president of the OMA uh, said that air pollution was a public health crisis in Ontario. And he said that air pollution was killing 1,800 people a year in Ontario. Well, that changed everything. While the politicians could ignore the environmentalists when we said air pollution was killing people, they could not ignore Ontario's doctors. And as a result, they had to find a solution. And that's where we came in. Because while the doctors could identify that air pollution was a public health crisis, finding solutions, that was beyond their medical expertise. So we came in and we identified the solution. And we told the government, uh, by phasing out uh, our five dirty coal-fired power plants, we can get a dramatic reduction in smog. And we can get a dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas pollution. And we can get a dramatic reduction in mercury and, and lead pollution, which are serious neurotoxins that cause brain damage for babies. And we told the government, the people of Ontario, that by phasing out uh, the dirty coal plants, that would be equivalent to taking uh, 7 million cars off the road. So that was a, a powerful message. We came forward with a solution. Next slide, please. Uh, and so we, we couldn't just um, uh, uh, tell the government what the solution it was. We had to build up public support. So we, we produced this pamphlet about Ontario's dirty secret and revealed to the public that our five coal plants were at, add up to a big smog pollution, uh, a big smog problem. And as you can see in, in, on the pamphlet, we had a picture of a young child with an asthma inhaler. Very powerful message uh, to, to parents of young children. And so we distributed this pamphlet and we built up a large, and our message resonated with the public. And as a result, we were able to build up a very large coalition. So the Ontario Co uh, Clean Air Alliance became a coalition of more than 90 organizations including uh, 11 municipalities and our member organizations represented uh, over 6 million Ontarians. But our big break came in February, in February 2000. Uh, by 2000, the coal plants were now uh, owned by Ontario Power Generation. And in February of 2000, OPG or Ontario Power Generation announced they were going to put up their Lakeview coal-fired power plant in Mississauga for sale, put it up for sale. Now, the Lakeview coal plant was already the single largest air polluter in the whole GTA, despite the fact that it was only operating at 16% of its capacity. So we were able to tell Mayor Hazel McCallion of Mississauga that if the Lakeview plant was sold to the private sector, well, the new private owners could ramp up its, its output and its pollution by a factor of five. Well, that was absolutely not acceptable to Mayor Hazel McCallion. Next slide, please. So, so Mayor McCallion agreed to join us at a press conference outside of the Lakeview coal-fired power plant. And, and that press conference was in March, March 2000. And at that press conference, Hazel McCallion 
call for the phase out of coal burning at Lakeview. And that changed everything. Because here's the photo. This photo appeared in the Toronto Star the next day of me and Hazel McCallion at the Lakeview coal plant. And when people saw that photo in the Toronto Star, what they said to themselves is if both Hazel McCallion and the Ontario Clean Air Alliance think that we should be phasing out dirty coal, well, then it must make sense. So that was a really powerful me uh, message and it really kick-started our, our whole coal phase-out campaign to another level and put incredible pressure on the government of, of Premier Harris. And as a result, uh, in next year, one year later in March, 2001, Mike Harris's Minister of the Environment, Elizabeth Whitmer, came to the Lakeview Coal Fired Power Plant for her press conference. And at her press conference, she announced, she announced that she was going to issue a legally binding regulation to require the phasing out of coal burning at Lakeview by April, 2005. So that was great news. It was now one down and four to go. So now we had turned our attention on the Nanaco coal-fired power plant. Next slide, please. So we created a, a new pamphlet about Nanaco. And once again, we put right on the front cover, a picture of a child with an asthma inhaler. Uh, next slide, please. And on the inside of the pamphlet, we put a map that showed all the areas, the huge area of Ontario that was affected by nanocoke smog and its toxic air pollutants like mercury and lead and all the, the, the heavy metals that cause cancer. And this was a smog map and it had a huge impact because it showed that so much of Ontario was impacted uh, by Nanticoke's pollution, including Algonquin Park, which many people had assumed was a pristine wilderness area. So then in, 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 in the summer of 2002, we really ramped up our, our campaign against Nanticoke. And so that summer, we distributed our Nanticoke pamphlet to, to the 85,000 subscribers to Toronto Life magazine. And in addition, we bought 143 radio spots on CFRB, which was listened to by you know, conservative voters. And the, the radio spots talked about Nanticoke's pollution and, and the need to phase it out. And in addition, we bought three large billboards in downtown Toronto near where Premier Ernie Eves lived. And the billboards, you know, they had a picture of, of Nanticoke and they said, Nanticoke, Ontario's number one smog polluter, coal must go. And again, our message really resonated with, with the public, especially because the summer of 2002, there were lots and lots of bad smog days. So people were really aware of the air pollution problem. And then our biggest break came on, on September the 9th, which was the 25th smog day of 2002. And on September the 9th, Dalton McGinty, who was the leader of the opposition, he had a press conference at the Queens Park Media Studio. And at that press conference, Dalton McGinty promised that if he became Premier of Ontario, he would phase out all of our five dirty coal-fired power plants by 2007. A huge announcement. That was on September the 9th. On September the 10th, one day later, Howard Hampton, the leader of the NDP, matched Dalton's promise. He said that he also would phase out the dirty coal plants by 2007 if he became premier. And so now both the opposition parties were calling for a coal phase out by 2007. There was intense pressure on Premier Ernie Eves to make a similar commitment. So guess what happened? On September the 18th, just nine days after Dalton McGuinty made his promise, Ernie Eves, the premier of Ontario, committed Ontario 
to a complete phase out of all of our coal plants by 2015. And so that was great news. And then in 2003, Dalton McGuinty was elected with a majority government on a pledge to phase out the coal-fired power plants by 2007. By 2007. So by 2003, uh, you, you might have thought the coal phase out, well, it was a done deal. We could relax and we could retire. But we certainly didn't do that. Because despite the fact that uh, Dalton McGuinty had won a majority government on a promise to phase out coal by 2007, the coal phase out was very strongly opposed by some very powerful special interests. It was opposed by Ontario Power Generation that owned the dirty coal plants. It was opposed by the Power Workers Union that, uh, who, whose members worked in the coal plants. And it was opposed by the Association of Major Power Consuming uh, 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 Companies of Ontario. You know, the big dirty um, companies like Inco that, 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 that like cheap, uh, dirty coal-fired electricity. And it was also uh, opposed by the energy bureaucrats at the IESO and the Ministry of Energy. And so they engaged in the usual scare tactics that the coal phase out would lead to a huge rise in electricity rates. It would lead to blackouts, all the traditional scare tactics. And, you know, they were, they were partially successful and they did slow the coal phase out down. As a result of their strong opposition, in 2005, Dalton McGuinty broke his promise to phase out the coal plants by 2007. He, in 2007, he said he, he wouldn't do it by, in 2005, he said he wouldn't do it by 2007, but he would do it by 2009. And we were actually okay with that because, but 2009 was a more, more reasonable schedule. But then in 2006, then in 2006, Dalton McGinty um, broke his promise to, to phase out the coal plants by 2009. And this time, when he broke his promise, uh, he didn't set a new date. So this was a huge betrayal, a huge betrayal to us. We had lost everything. Now, the, now there was no longer a, a, a date when the government of Ontario was committed to phasing out dirty coal. So this was a huge setback. We'd lost everything. So we fought back really, really hard. We, we put a lot of pressure on Dalton McGinty. Uh, we caused him to, to lose an important by-election. And as a result of all the intense pressure we put on him, in August 2007, Dalton McGinty issued legally binding regulations that required the phase out of all of our dirty coal plants by December 31st, uh, 2014. So the coal phase out was back on track, but 2014, that date was seven years off. That wasn't good enough for us. And we continued to put the pressure on Dalton McGinty to close the coal plant sooner. And as a result of our continued pressure, he, he, he gave orders to Ontario Power Generation to dramatically ramp down uh, the pollution from the coal plants. And as a result, by 2011, the coal plants were only producing about 2% of our electricity. And remember when we started, it was, it was 25%. So by 2011, we, we achieved an almost virtual coal phase out. And then Dalton actually uh, phased out all of the coal plants except Thunder Bay before 2014. And then the, the last coal plant was shut down on April 8th, 2014, when the Thunder Bay uh, was shut, uh, coal plant was shut down. So we did win, the, we did win the, our campaign. And the key last message that I, I want to leave with you is, is one of the key factors why we won is that we were persistent. We were persistent. We worked on this campaign every single day for 17 years until the last coal plant was actually shut down. We didn't retire in 2002 or 2003, when there was a political commitment uh, to, to, to phase out coal. What you have to do is not only get the politicians 
to promise to do what you want, but you have to make sure that they actually do it. And that means staying on the job until the, the job is completed. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. Jack, thank you so much. What an amazing, inspiring, powerful story. There are so many people in the chat saying this story shows the value of persistence and of leadership. We heard that in your story in Yafet. So it's it's really great to hear that when people really are persistent and stick to the message that that wins happen. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with all of us. Um, and so now we're going to hear go back to Lana and hear about how all of you can get involved in your communities um, and how we can win if we work together. Thanks, Kimia. Yes, so having heard uh, these great success stories, uh, let's talk about what we can do to stop these current gas plants um, and uh, make sure we're moving towards a clean energy future. So as we mentioned, we don't yet know where all of the places are that will have gas projects proposed. But we can start preparing for when the proposals do pop up, which could be soon. Um, and that includes spreading the word about Ontario's overall plan by displaying lawn signs, window signs, spreading the word on social media, doing local outreach and organizing. And then as soon as we hear about actual proposals and contracts, we'll set up an online email tool so you can send a note to all of your local municipal councillors with detailed information on why they should say no to the project. For folks who would like to do more, uh, we're planning a training on how to reach out to speak, how to reach out to and speak with municipal council members along with information on how to answer common questions about gas generation. So if you live in one of these areas with an existing gas plant, you can sign up for our newsletter, Select Climate, and we'll send you action alerts for your neighborhood, uh, details on our upcoming training session, a sign up form for lawn signs, and other tools to support your local activism. If you don't live anywhere near a gas plant but still want to do something, you can send a note to the federal government and ask it to strengthen the clean electricity regulations to prohibit the construction of new gas plants in the next few years. Uh, and if we all take action in our communities, we can stop these gas plants in their tracks. And I'll pass it back to Kimia to take questions. Amazing. Thank you. Yes, we have so many uh, questions and I hope to get to as many as we can. If you have any more, again, a reminder, there's a Q&A button, button at the bottom of your screens um, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Also, we are recording this event today and posting it to YouTube and Facebook at Enviro Defense. So if you have to leave early or you want to refer back to something, share it with a friend, we'll be sharing the recording afterwards. So without further ado, I wanna to get to some of these questions. Um, so one that I have seen a couple of times is about carbon capture. Um, Rachel is wondering, what are the panelists' opinions on carbon capture and storage, which will now be allowed in Ontario under Bill 91? Is this just another excuse to justify more gas use? Um, so why don't we start with Lana? Uh, or Jack, you've come off mute. You wanna start us off with that one? Yes, uh, carbon and capture and storage, it, it doesn't reduce the pollution 100% like renewables do or energy efficiency. And second, it's incredibly expensive. And the IESO, the Independent Electricity System Operator, in their reports, they've said that carbon capture and storage uh, doesn't make financial sense for Ontario. So, I mean, the problem is that, you know, people like Doug Ford are always trying to uh, make us pursue the highest cost options uh, uh, to deal with our pollution problems. And, and we've got to start focusing on the lowest cost options to, to phase out the gas-fired power plants, which are energy efficiency, Quebec water power, and Ontario wind and solar. And I'll just add to that that we also haven't seen carbon capture and storage work at a large scale anywhere. It's, it's not succeeding. We don't know if it's going to work. Um, so, you know, we can't rely on this. And 
as as the person who asked the question suggested, it is just an excuse uh, for gas companies to continue operating. Um, so it's a false solution. Thank you. Yafet, anything you'd like to add there? Beautiful. We'll come back to you. We have some good organizing questions. Um, but on this vein, um, in, in regards to kind of alternative energy options, um, there both Colin and Michelle have asked, why not build clean nuclear stations instead of polluting gas? Um, so I know, Jack, you have uh, expertise on this as well, if you want to start us off with this question. Well, yes. Uh, well, first of all, uh, nuclear stations are not clean. They produce deadly radioactive waste which will last for a million years. So when we're pursuing the nuclear option, we're, we're creating a huge toxic legacy that we're passing on to future generations to deal with for a million years. And so that's just not fair. And it also doesn't make sense to pursue nuclear because it's the highest cost option. Why would we want to pursue uh, nuclear when wind and solar uh, can uh, keep our lights on at less than half the cost? It makes no economic sense. And, and the third problem with nuclear is it's way too slow. Uh, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has told us that we must dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas pollution by, by 2030, by almost 50% to prevent temperatures from rising by more than 1.5 1, 1, 1 degrees. But nuclear is too slow to do that. Again, according to the IESO, which is a government of Ontario agency, it would take 10 to 15 years to build a new nuclear uh, station. So new nuclear can't provide us with the, green, the dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas pollution we need now. Whereas wind and solar, they can be constructed in one year and energy efficiency is even cheaper, is even quicker. I mean, you can install a heat pump tomorrow and get big reductions in your pollution tomorrow. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we Next, we have a question for Yefet. Um, did the Ford government threaten retaliation for the York, York Southwestern decision? I can see the Ford government threatening to take actions against municipalities that make these decisions. They've already taken development charges away. Uh, in the scenario I shared, there wasn't any direct retaliation. The, the decision to move from the gas plant was made in 2017, um, March of 2017. The Ford government didn't come in until you know more than a year later in, in June 2018. And by that point, the, the, the move away from the gas plant had already come underway. Um, but that doesn't mean that can't happen. I mean, we've just seen news recently, Ford's doubling down on the commitment to build more gas plants. I think I just saw a story earlier this week or last week on that on something just that on, in that very same vein. So um, we're gonna we I think we have seen there is a commitment to not honor that kind of work, really showing the need to keep the pressure going on the local organizing I was referring to. Wonderful, thank you. Anyone else want to respond to that piece? That retaliation. We have a question that's kind of similar in uh, in regards to municipal councils. So if municipal councils do vote against um, these proposals, are are there boards in place that can um, push through the projects anyway, even without the municipal support resolutions? I mean, it's pretty clear that both the independent electricity system operator and the Ministry of Energy are requiring these municipal resolutions in support. Um, who knows, like maybe they can find a way around it. Um, but right now it does look like uh, perhaps the province is trying to avoid, um, you know, another scandal around, around these gas plants and they are seeking municipal resolutions in support. Um, so, you know, the important thing is that we ensure that they don't get support. Um, and then we have an argument on our side that, you know, the municipalities don't want this and, and there shouldn't be efforts to, to sideline those decisions. Um, I, I wanted to, I, I would add that, um, I think the story I shared 
you know, really showed that there is a, that, that the regional or local um, context matters. And so in our, in, in the York Southwestern scenario, um, it was, it was, a, it wasn't just limited to the municipal uh, level in terms of uh, dealing with city council. In fact, we largely large had to deal with the provincial, um, with, with the provincial government because it was, they were trying to implement the gas plant through a uh, provincial, provincial infrastructure project like the LRT. So, um, and if there's something else that we've learned in the Ford government, I, we heard the phrase, the municipalities are a creature of the province. I think that's something we learned if you uh, remember during the uh, ward merger in Toronto, uh, that municip the munis munis municipalities fall under the province and are creatures of, that, of, of, of their constitutional rights. So you don't limit yourself to where you can put pressure. And, that's, and I think that's the important component here. Um, and a lot of times these things are not coming down to what votes happen at the council at the council level, right? They come they, they come about based off of plans that are implemented um, at uh, that, that give discretion to councillors to where they dedicate funding and dedicate resources. So the point is you, you when when it comes to how you bring communities together, you want to be really clear on what is the local context of how a gas plant or is being implemented under what mechanism is being implemented. Wonderful, awesome context, thank you. There are a couple of different questions here, people asking about alternatives. So wind, solar, um, conservation, um, why are different uh, alternatives not being encouraged? Are these alternatives cheaper? Are they are they real legitimate alternatives to gas plants and affordable alternatives? And where would we situate these? So whoever wants to start can come off mute and, and take it away. Well, Jack's organization just released a study on location. So go ahead, Jack. Well, yes, for example, the Great Lakes are, are a great location. We've got a huge wind power potential in the Great Lakes. According to a study that was done for uh, the Ontario Power Authority, uh, 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 great, the the wind power uh, wind power in the, in the Great Lakes could provide Ontario with more than 100% of its electricity needs at a cost that's 40% lower than the cost of new nuclear reactors. So we've got a huge potential there in the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, there's a a moratorium on 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 Great Lakes wind power. So at the moment, we're getting uh, zero electricity from the Great Lakes, and so we're calling on Doug Ford to to lift this moratorium. Of course, there's also a huge potential for, for wind power uh, uh, onshore, on land in Ontario. And there is a huge potential for solar. And, you know, we should be putting solar um, PV on, on our roofs of our homes and our buildings. And Doug Ford should be paying people, paying residential customers to provide uh, a solar, um, solar PV electricity uh, to the grid. Because uh, because because that can contribute the peaker plants the proposed peaker plants are, are Doug Ford says we need them to keep the lights on on our our hottest summer days when our air conditioners are running full out. Well, that's when solar power is at its maximum. So Doug Ford should be um, buying all the solar power he can from from residences and small businesses that have solar PV on their roofs, but he refuses to do that. All he wants to do is buy power from big companies like big gas companies or big battery storage companies. And another great way to, to meet our, our peak electricity demands is from our electric vehicles. Uh, electric vehicles, if they have bi-directional chargers, that means that they can be charged up on off-peak hours and then supply power back to the grid during peak demand hours. So if we were to install bi-directional chargers, and if we were to pay homeowners to provide electricity back to the grid from their electric vehicles during peak demands, that's another way we could avoid the need for the, the gas-fired peaker plants at a gain at a much lower cost. Because you've got to remember these gas-fired peaker plants, they're only going to be operated for one to 2% of the hours of the year. And that means that their cost per kilowatt hour is incredibly high because the capital cost is spread over such a small volume. So 
the, all these other options are much lower cost. We can also pay customers um, to shift some of their load from peak periods to off peak periods. Again, a much lower cost option. Now the ISO is doing that now to a small extent, but the amount of money they pay customers to shift to off peak periods is incredibly low. It's, it's only like 2% of the cost of a new gas fired peaker plant. And so it, there's a total imbalance. We pay, Doug Ford wants to pay a lot of money for a gas fired peaker plant, but he won't pay customers much money um, to shift their demand from peak to off peak periods. And finally, uh, to meet our, our peak demands in the summer, we, should, we could solve it all just by buying more power from Hydro-Quebec. Hydro-Quebec is a winter peaking electricity system. So in the summer, they've got a huge surplus of hydroelectric capacity. Now, Doug Ford says we need an extra 1500 megawatts of, of gas-fired power plants to keep the lights on in the summer. Well, we could easily import uh, 1500 megawatts of, of clean hydropower from, from Quebec in the summer as, a, as an alternative to these gas-fired peaker plants. So what Doug Ford's being driven by is by ideology, a hatred for renewables, and also because he's serving the interests of large gas-fired power companies like Ontario Power Generation and large nuclear companies that don't want wind and solar to get established. Because if wind and solar get established in Ontario and people see how cheap they are and how great they are, then it's gonna make it very, very difficult for any government to build future high cost nuclear power plants. And that's what Ontario Power Generation and Bruce Power are terrified of. That was very comprehensive. So just one tiny thing um, I wanted to address because uh, one of the questions specifically said, you know, is there a connection between um, the government's decision not to renew its contract with Hydro-Quebec um, and the current gas expansion? And I think the answer is yes, they decided not to renew last year and now they're able to use that as an excuse that they're lacking somehow in electricity. Uh, now we need to build these gas plants when that the continuation of that contract and an expansion of the imports um, would have helped meet growing electricity demands and we would not need and we don't need gas for many other reasons. But um, yes, I think it was a very sneaky move on their part um, to do that. Thanks for addressing that, Lana. Um, so there's there's another question about Hydro Quebec and the electric supply. Is it the case that um, there is a risk to the supply uh, being capped out because of jurisdictions? Um, different jurisdictions have larger larger demands, specifically naming New York and New England states. So does that potentially put that supply out of access for Ontario? Well, well not now. Uh, uh... If, if, if Quebec, Hydro-Quebec's got a huge surplus. Last year, their electricity exports to the US and Ontario were equivalent to 25% of our electricity consumption. And what we should be doing is, is locking in uh, long-term contracts so that we can have that supply for 10 or, or 20 years. Uh, unfortunately, now the, uh, the Doug Ford's canceled the existing contract uh, that we have with Hydro-Quebec we just get our, our electricity from Quebec under spot market sales. And so if you want to have long-term security, like New York State's getting, well, then you've got to sign long-term contracts. And Hydro-Quebec has offered us long-term contracts uh, for large quantities of supply, but we've turned them down. Again, irrational uh, from the point of view of consumers and the environment, but this policy of electricity separatism, it's designed to protect the Ontario generators, uh, the private owned private sector gas companies, and to protect Ontario power generation and Bruce power from competition. The last thing those Ontario companies want is competition from Hydro-Quebec. And, but there's, there's one exception in Ontario, you know, guess which city in Ontario has the lowest electricity rates? It's the city of Cornwall. And why is that? 
because the city of Cornwall has got 100% of their electricity supply from Hydro-Quebec pursuant to long-term contracts for 50 years, 50 years. Cornwall's had the lowest electricity rates because they've had got all their supply from Hydro-Quebec. And for those of you who are as old as I am, you'll remember the 2003 blackout uh, when the power was off in Ontario. And we didn't return to full power for eight days because of our dependence on, on unreliable nuclear reactors. But in the 2003 blackout, the lights never went out in the city of Cornwall that was getting 100% of its electricity from water power from Quebec. That's fascinating, thank you. Um, so someone asks, how far away are we from having the technology to store wind and solar energy? I agree it's the best option, but some days we don't get enough wind and solar to be able to power the grid. Well, yes, those technologies exist today. And, and that's one of the things that Doug Ford's procuring, hoping to procure now, not just new gas fired power plants, but also large stationary batteries. So that's part of the solution. And, and so, and there's also, of course, other um, storage options, which are even lower cost than large stationary batter, uh, batteries. And the lower cost storage options are, are electric vehicles batteries, put them to two uses, not just powering our cars, but also providing storage for our electricity grid. And then another great storage option are Hydro-Quebec's giant hydroelectric reservoirs. And they can also be used as a storage option for our wind and solar. And according to an MIT study, they are actually the lowest cost storage option for, for wind and solar. But once again, we've got a premier of Ontario that again focuses on high cost solutions to benefits large energy companies and it, it, based in Ontario. And he ignores the Hydro-Quebec option, which is much lower cost and he ignores the electric vehicle option, which will put money in the pockets of, uh, of, of people who live in Ontario, uh, people who drive electric vehicles, but he doesn't want to do that. He, is, he instead wants to reward large um, energy companies that are going to build these stationary um, uh, batteries. And just to add in terms of um, larger storage, um, these technologies also exist, um, and there are really interesting um, examples, including right here in Ontario, where uh, there's a company using compressed air, uh, another one is using flywheel technology, um, and there are other examples in North America, including creating ice in off-peak periods, um, pumping water to higher elevation reservoirs, um, all of this exists and is being used. What we need to do is invest in these options. Um, and that would allow the solar and wind to be used uh, when needed. And, and unfortunately, my understanding is that some of the storage that's currently being uh, procured is still for the gas plants. So we really need to pivot um, and, and create the infrastructure for these renewable alternatives. If I can just add here that the, the existing alternatives that were in play was a key component of how we pressured um, uh, governments to find alternatives because that's, that was not something they were willing to consider, but being able to point to what alternatives already were in existence and how they applied to the specific project that they were built, trying to build in York Southwest, it was a key part of forcing them to, even if they didn't try the solar power panels or using that as a backup generator, find their own, find alternatives that were different from the gas plant became a key component. So being able to provide those alternatives, I, I would say it's an important part of how you uh, provide solutions to the problems that they allege they're trying to address. That's great. And so, you know, this is all very technical. It's helpful to know this the the possible solutions, but then there's how to get them known at it in the community on a local level. So there's a question on how do we make this issue that is not well known relevant to people at the local level and, and encourage them to get involved. So I know Yafet, yeah, you spoke a bit about the info sessions. I don't know if you want to start on, on this question about encouraging the community. Sorry, the question being uh, how to 
how to make how to get the community to know about these issues be interested see how it's connected to them and get engaged well i don't have a very sexy answer for that to be it's like um, it's i and i think jack's story is uh i think really highlighted the point i was trying to make about being consistent and that um, I think sometimes when, when it comes to an organized people get bogged down in this the size or uh, of the of their group they have right now or their coalition. And you know, I I think I, I, it's a phrase I use: as small as big. And I, I think that's a key component, especially when it comes to local organizing. Um, you want you you have to be yeah you have to be consistent, but educating. Uh, communities around how this applies to them and how this makes sense for uh, the community they're in, how they save money, how it's impacted for the environment, how um, uh, the, the decisions that are being made at the local level are not being done be because of sound research or because of um, you know uh, deep consultation. Uh, the gas plant example that I was sharing, they were trying to implement it in spite of the community consultations, right? And so uh, the coalition of us being present and being consistent at the at, at meetings run by municipal and provincial elected officials and their and their subsidiary bodies was a key part of how we were able to keep that pressure. And I think that's I think that's a key a key component. Uh, being able to be consistent, be present, um, and trying to be as ahead of that as possible. We were involved in those community consultations and started our own activism well before construction was going to start. But even though I think our I think the timelines for us was maybe a year and a half, two years before construction was planned to start, it's still not a long time in ahead of time. So uh, you know, local issues. Uh, you know, a lot of these things are planned years in advance, but people don't know or not paying attention well to it well well after it's too late and so having having to get involved locally at, a, at an early stage and building a broad coalition is a key component but i wouldn't what i would say is focus on building your local group and uh being consistent around the education uh you're doing with your community whether that's newsletters in uh periodic information sessions uh and leverage your resources that you have now um, resources doesn't mean you have a lot of money, but, you know, I would, for us, our existing resources were the networks we had in our communities and knowing and, and trying to tap into those to bring people together became a key component of, I think, of how we were able to build pressure because we were able to bring a, a broad, a broad network of people together. That's fantastic. Somebody asked, what is the number one thing they can do right now? And I think building, starting to build your coalition, starting to tap into and build those networks is a fantastic way for people to get started after this webinar. So we are almost out of time. I'm going to try to get to one or two more questions. Um, so there's a question from Patty that is, um, what is the impact of the 2018 Access to Natural Gas Act and the current natural gas expansion program to subsidize Enbridge to build 44 new pipelines? And is there something that can be done to support the rural municipalities who will be impacted by these 44 new pipelines? Yeah, so just to clarify, uh, this is also about natural gas, but this is about heating using natural gas or fossil gas, as, as I've been trying to call it. Um, and so Enbridge is in the process of expanding its uh, gas infrastructure to go to new communities, additional communities. It's also um, in the midst of a massive expansion project that ratepayers are going to be on the hook for. Um, so it's a, it's a little separate, but also um, also fossil gas also terrible for the climate. Um, we are starting to work on this more um, as, as these proposals keep coming up. Um, so I would, I would say stay tuned for more on that one. Wonderful. And a quick question on when coal was phased out, what replaced the power that coal produced? Well, the, the McGuinty government replaced uh, coal with a, a, a whole mix of options, uh, including energy efficiency, including wind and solar, uh, including gas, and including um, 
uh, restarting uh, the, the nuclear power plants that had been shut down. It's important to remember that uh, uh, in 1998, uh, the former Ontario Hydro unexpectedly shut down seven of its nuclear reactors for safety reasons. And all of those reactors were shut down for at least five years. And two of those reactors are still shut down. And it was as it was as a result of the the shutdown of all these nuclear reactors for safety reasons that there was a huge spike in coal fired electricity generation. Coal fired electricity generation rose by more than one hundred and twenty percent because of the shutdown of the nuclear reactors. And one of the one of the options that that Dalton McGinty pursued was rebuilding uh, some of these shutdown nuclear reactors. And the rebuilds went hugely over, over budget and, and that pushed up our electricity rates. So we would have had lower electricity rates if, he, if, if Dalton McGinty had put more emphasis on the lower cost and cleaner options. That is fantastic. Thank you, Jack. And thank you, everybody, for all of the stories that you've shared, um, for the the motivation that you've given all of us. You know, I'm taking away that today you can start, you can start to engage your community, let people in the community know, build coalitions, um, share the resources that are coming from Environmental Defense, that are coming from Ontario Clean Air Alliance, and target your advocacy both at the provincial and municipal levels. Um, and persistence and leadership leadership is key. So we may not see impacts in one month, two months, three months, sometimes in two years, sometimes in 17 years. Um, so I think we've we've taken a lot away. Uh, if we didn't get to your questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but thank you all so much for participating. Thank you to all of the panelists, to Lana, to Yafet, to Jack for the knowledge and insight that you've shared with all of us um, and for all of your thoughtful questions and remarks. Um, and thank you to you for tuning in to the webinar. It's really encouraging, inspiring to see all of you taking action to protect the climate, to protect our air quality. Um, I feel energized to continue the fight in Windsor and beyond. So please do keep in touch. You can follow Environmental Defense on Twitter or Facebook at Enviro, E-N-V-I-R-O, Defense, or reach out on email. Um, so that is all we have for tonight. I look forward to organizing and working with all of you over the next period of time while we, we continue to try and stop this um, gas plant expansion. Um, and for tonight, we all wish you a very lovely evening. So thank you and good night, everybody.